very best friend All right. Someone that I can depend on When he's forgiving me of my sins So I never get enough oh, no. Never get enough of him Good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for being with us tonight on this Wednesday night Bible class. Uh, I want to say to those that are visiting with us, uh, we are glad that you're here, and we hope that you're returning visitors, and we hope that we have new visitors as we go through this lesson in the book of Genesis. Uh, we're going to jump into this lesson tonight because I've got uh, several things that I want to share. Uh, not that it's going to be so lengthy, but that's just going to be some explanations and some, some conversations that are going to be taking place that I want to make sure I get it all in. So again, thank you for being here, and let us go to the Lord in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, we thank you for another blessed opportunity to come together and to be able to share your word. Be with us, Heavenly Father, as we've studied and in which we put this lesson together, that it may be beneficial to those that are listening, edifying to the church, uplifting to thee, Heavenly Father, give me the glory that you so well deserve. Bless each and every individual under the sound of my voice. With such things you see, they stand in need of. These things we humbly ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's just jump into our lesson. This is uh, <clears throat> the lesson of Temptation Enters. And now we are on the portion that it talks about the woman on page 29. Uh, just leaving over here on the section where it was talking about the serpent and all how he was and how cunning, cunning he was and his deception, deception to, uh, to Eve and how it is that he was able to uh, uh, test her, her faith in God and of course, we know that she failed that test, but uh, he tested her faith uh, by uh, getting her to do what it is that God had told her specifically not to do. And so uh, he was cunning, he was crafty, and having to do with him being able to even speak has to do with his craftiness and his ability to have a, a power uh, within himself that was not uh, part of the uh, regular plan uh, that God had. And so with that being said, we're going to talk about that woman that God had gave to Adam and her uh, significance in this, in this situation. So we're going to start out in, on page 29, and we're just going to begin reading. This is taken out of Genesis, the third chapter, and these are verses 6 through 13. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through, through 13. Being that we've already read these scriptures, I'm not going to read them again, I'm just locating the book and saying this in case I have to go back to something uh, specifically. But the author says, and it reads as follows, motivated by the serpent's lies, Eve turned her attention to the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. It says that she was standing close, and it says, no, why she was standing close to the tree in the first place is not revealed in the text. Her proximity uh, to that which she was uh, not even supposed to touch provided the serpent an opportunity to act. Sadly, we do the same thing. When we go places that Christians have no reason to go, or we watch things which Christians have no reason to watch, uh, then it's hard enough, it says, to resist temptation itself without inviting it into our lives. And it tells us to beware. So it's hard enough uh, trying to resist the temptations of the world as it is. But then we invite them. In other words, we put ourselves in positions or in situations whereby the temptation is there and it's prevalent. And now we have to be trying to trust our instincts on whether to or whether not to uh, partake therein. If we don't go to that, we don't go where we know the temptation is, we don't look at what we know the temptation could cause, and we don't talk after the people that could cause those temptations, then we rarely find ourselves having to be in a position where we have to yield to those temptations. So we must as Christians be aware of those kind of situations. It says, upon examination, Eve saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Talking out of Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. As Longman noted, the, first, uh, the fruit appealed to the woman's senses, that it was good for food, and that it was pleasing to the eye, those two senses. You have sight, sight and uh, uh, in taste. So she followed her senses rather than God's instructions and ate the fruit. She then gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. It says, it is only at this point in the story that we hear that Adam was present. 
but apparently he witnessed the entire interchange. Without speaking or even acting, he witnessed it. To those who want to blame Eve, we say at least Eve presented an argument to the, uh, to the serpent in regards to the guy said, don't do this. Adam just caved in without even a comment. The bottom line is that both are equally culpable, culpable of the first sin against God. They are both, both equally in the wrong because both of them had the same instruction. Both of them knew what not to do, yet did it anyway. The immediate result of this sin is reported in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fixed leaves together and made themselves covering. In addition to their efforts to hide their newly discovered nakedness, Adam and Eve also attempted to hide from God. Nevertheless, the one who knows and sees all was not tricked. God called them and he asked, Where are you? And Adam responded, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Not willing to allow Adam's guilt to get unnoticed, God questioned, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded you that you should not eat of? This final question is especially important. Making this point, Hamilton wrote, unlike God's earlier questions, which solicited general information, in this interrogation, God becomes prosecutor. But rather, than charges the man with, trans with transgression. God allows the man to acknowledge his crime. Thus, the question urges confession rather than condemnation. And I like this. I like this because God has allowed Adam to speak up. God knows. God already knew. He questioned him because he wanted him to be, he, he wanted the man to, to, uh, to acknowledge it and to confess it himself. He wanted that. And so in Adam's doing so, he had to make, make sure that he realized that, hey, it wasn't anything on you, God. You, you didn't make this happen. You know, it was something up by some other means that I know that I am now naked and that I did not know that before. And God checked him out. He knew he had to be doing something. He knew he ate of that tree that he told him not to. So he also, uh, in the prosecution of it, he just elaborated to him that, hey, I know you ate of that tree. He didn't have to say it like that. He said, did you? He wanted the man in his mind to be thinking and feeling guilty. Yes, I did. You know, yes, I did. But God knew that he had eaten of that tree, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He knew he had done that, but he needed him to acknowledge that. Unfortunately, Adam's confession was more like an accusation. Instead of repenting of the sin and asking for forgiveness, he deflected the blame and said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. When God asked the woman about the sin, she followed Adam's example and passed the blame on to the servant. That's what you did. Lay in blame. Don't want to stand up and be accountable for what you did wrong. Don't want to be responsible for what things that we do. And the world is like that today. We get like that sometimes. In smaller matters, in smaller matters, we find ourselves uh, not wanting to be accountable. You know, we want to say, well, the boss said to do it this way, you know. Uh, and not realizing that if you didn't do it the way it was supposed to have been done, then if it came out wrong, it was your fault. But even if, you, if it came out in a different way, it was right because you didn't do it the way it was supposed to be done. I'd rather do something the way that it was, I was told to do it. If something bad happens, then I can at least stand up and say, I did it the way that it was written up. I did it the way that it was told for me to do it. And if there's something wrong in the writing, then the writer owns that. I don't. But if I change what the writer has said to make it easier for myself or more simple for myself or figure out there's another way without communicating to the writer, the originator, that this is where I'm going to do it to get their buy-in. And I do it the other way because I think it's easier and it goes wrong, then I have to own that. Just like I would own it if it went right and did better. I would be owning that and say, hey, I did it this way and this is my way and it works better. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how it's supposed to be done. But a lot of times that's how we do things. Let's go to punishments. Page 30. Because God is righteous, he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. Consequently, he addressed the rebellion of Adam and Eve. Before speaking to the first couple, however, he addressed the serpent. He stated, because you have done this, 
In other words, deceived both Adam and Eve. You are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly shall you go. You shall eat the dust of all the days of your life. Whether this curse produced a change in the serpent's form is debated. Steinman observed, while the curse is often understood as the serpent being made to move on his belly, it ought to be noted that the other judgments of God do not transform the basic nature of either the woman or the man. Therefore, the curse most likely did not transform the locomotion of snakes, more or less the locomotion being the movement from place to place and how they move from place to place. Instead, the locomotion will now be subject to fertility. Fertility. Unnecessary that we have to worry about that, but as far as that snake is concerned, it's useless. It's useless. He would ingest dust, a raw material that was used to make Adam, and the dust that would be left as a result of human's death. More importantly, God promised to put enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and her seed. The serpent would inflict minor pain on the seed of a woman. The seed of woman and Jesus would bruise the serpent's head. Gresham concluded the fulfillment of the prophecy will come to its climax in, in the thorough, in the in and through Jesus Christ. Paul even echoed Genesis 3.15 when he closed his letter to the Christians in Rome by saying, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will crush him. He's going to bruise him. He's going to make it hard for Satan to be able to do what he wants to do just when he wants to do it in the of time. As punishment for her sin, evil soul to her pain in childbearing would greatly increase. Additionally, God added, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Adam's punishment included the increased difficulty of his work. God declared, in your sweat, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you shall return. Kissling summarized it as this. Man's service to the ground will no longer be enjoyable and easily productive work. It will now be a battle with creation for survival. So, we learned that woman, Eve, she blamed the snake. She blamed the snake. Adam blamed Eve. There was a blame game that was going on. But that woman that God gave to man had the opportunity to stand up. And she was even, at some points, a lot more bolder than even Adam. Because she faced it and confronted that snake. Not to the point of not doing what God wanted her to do. Not to the point of making sure that she obeyed God. She rather gave in to that snake. But she did have words with him. And she did acknowledge what God had said. Yeah. yeah. And so Adam, as the book said, I can see him just standing there, not being the man he should be hiding behind her, it sounds like it. Side, hiding behind her, not voicing his opinion, not stepping up. And I'm really, really truly not seeing his point as being the man that he should be. Being the leader he should be. You know, He's seen woman, uh, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And I believe, as I said last week, that he felt that he was even with Eve. That he was even with her. And so he felt like they had a balance. And so if she made certain decisions in the garden, then he could follow her. And he made certain decisions, she could follow him. But he never did take it in his mind. It doesn't seem like that God put him there first and he gave them the, him the ability, him, Adam, to name all the animals and creatures in this garden and to to name all this stuff and have so much authority and so much uh, preeminence in this garden. And he never did get that. It was almost like he was just numb to that. And I think he was just thinking on the creature standpoint than how God the Creator wanted him to, uh, to, look at that, to look at that situation. All right, let's go to applications. Let's go to application. Although the devil does not tempt us uh, exactly as the serpent tempted Eve, he still walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom, seeking whom he can devour, 1 Peter 5 and 8. 
Rather than yielding to the temptations placed uh, before us, we must resist them, steadfast in the faith. We will be tempted in the same three areas he utilized to tempt Eve. And that's the sin, that's lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. Thankfully, we do not have to yield, as Paul noted. There will always be a new way to escape, and we simply have to seek it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. So there's a way to escape the temptations, um, brothers and sisters, that the devil puts before us. Uh, for the sake of Adam doing what he did, now we know in childbearing, uh, it's painful for women. I mean, that's all men can talk about is how painful it is by the stories we hear uh, that are told by the women. And so they have to they have to go through the childbearing and however many months that it is. I think it's nine months, and and then they have to lay there and just have to. It's just it's just excruciating pain. It sounds like, but for Adam, Adam messed up so much that God said that one time. Well, at one time Adam wasn't gonna have to do anything, but just tend to that, that Garden of Eden. I'm sure everything was easy for him. It wasn't anything that, I don't see him having to use anything, of course, made by the hands of man uh, to tend to that job that he had in the, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, in paradise. It looks like all the work that he would have had to do would have been easy. It wouldn't even be, probably have even been considered as work. It just would have been him being busy, taking care of the things that God wanted him to take care of. And I'm sure that with God's help, he would have had that. And, would have been anything he needed to do that he couldn't do. Just like today. It's nothing we need to do that we can't do. It's just that we have to work harder to get it done. You know, we have to rely on God through our prayers to get it done. It's no more uh, handed to us and made, made simple for us. We have to actually go and get it. We have to go and ask for it. We have to uh, uh, pray about it and plead for it. And at that time, when God created man, we didn't have to do all those things. Everything was made simple made simple for us. But we have to learn that temptations, they come and they go. They come by no, uh, should come by, if they do come, by no uh, initiative of our own. We shouldn't initiate the temptations. We shouldn't be trying to test uh, God. Uh, we should be yielding to his will and allowing his will to be done in our lives. That's how we, we would get things done. But we shouldn't be trying to test, test God. We shouldn't be trying to test our faith. You know, all we want to do is know, make sure and remember that when things come that we didn't have anything to do with, God is able to take care of that situation. If I didn't initiate the sin, God is able to take that same sin and give me a way of escape. Because I didn't ask for that. It came. It's the devil's way of trying to get me to yield to him and not yield to God. So with that being said, we're going to go straight to our discussion. Straight to our discussion on page 34. And, verse, and then number one it says, what can we do to avoid yielding to temptation? Don't know what you wrote. Hope you wrote something. Hope you are writing things. And pinning something down so you can remember, put it down and remember it for yourself. But I said, for me, is to don't test God, as I just said. Don't test him. You need to avoid the things that you know are a struggle in your faith and in your life. There's things that we know that we struggle with. You know, we always use smoking cigarettes. And everything like that. We a lot of times we use drinking and things like that. But it's what you watch on television. You know, it, it's, it's it's certain things. It's what you listen to on the radio. You know, um, it's the places that you go that you may and the purpose and your motivation for going to those places. And you know what they are. The things that you are weak in uh, when you and you knew you were weak in them when you were in the world before you became a member of the body of Christ. And now that you're a member of the body of Christ, you you faithfully studying God's word and you're active in the church. Every once in a while Satan will try to slip something in on you and everything. And when it comes, you recognize it because you know at one time that was a try, that was a, a test for you. That was, a, that was a, a trial for you. That was a, a hardship for you. And Satan just wants to see where you are now. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He knows that with your weakness, but he doesn't know how strong you are until you show him how strong you are. God knows both your strengths and your weaknesses. Satan only deals with your weaknesses. You don't care how strong you are to God. And that's why God told, told Satan, here, here's Job. You know, here's Job. You know, check him out. Because Satan didn't know how strong Job was until he was witnessed it. Until he witnessed it. He didn't even know how, he didn't even see any weaknesses in him. That's why he didn't even consider Job. 
because he didn't see it. He seen, he, all he saw was the man that God called out by name and told him to say, here he is, you know, and he felt like he could get anybody. Satan felt like he could get anybody under his, under his control, and he realized that he can't when a man was as strong as Job in his faith and belief in God. And the same way we are. If you're that strong in your faith and belief in God, then Satan can test you with any kind of thing he wants to, and you won't yield to that temptation. And if you find yourself being a little weak, you'll call on God, and God will hear you because he knows that you're faithful, and uh, he will bring you up out of that temptation. That's what he says. That's what the scripture is saying. With that same temptation, he'll make a way for you to escape because he knows you're wanting to get out of it. You're strong enough to get out of it, and he'll like, allow you to use your faith to this utmost uh, power. Pay close attention to where... Uh, to where you're going, uh, pay close attention to the warning signs from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives with us and walks with us and talks with us on a day-to-day -day basis gives us warning signs. It's things that make us stop and think, you know. It, it's things that deal with our conscience, you know. It's how we feel about uh, certain things as we're doing certain things or how we feel about what we just said or how we feel about what we're watching and where we go. And that's the Holy Spirit trying to tap into our senses and trying to say, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You don't want to. You really don't. You know. And then it's us rationalizing that out and saying, there's a reason why I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant on this. There's a reason why I'm not, I'm not saying what I'm saying. There's, there's got to be the fact that if I say it, I'm probably going to regret it. And I don't want to say anything I'm going to regret. If I say it, I may have to apologize for it. And I don't want to say anything that I have to apologize for. You know, if I say it, there's going to be a consequence down the line. And maybe if I say it, this person who has a chance to maybe one day hear the word may hear it and not believe it because of what I said. And if they hear the word, why can't they hear it from me? And so those kind of questions you would ask yourself, why, why not from me? Why is it someone else always has to teach someone else? Why can't I teach them? You know, why can't I teach them? And this is another way to avoid temptation. It's become a teacher. Study God's word and you yourself become a teacher. Of God's word. Become a student of the word. And being a student, that means at one time, as you study and you learn, then you will graduate. And when I say graduate, not saying that you have fulfilled all the obligations of it, it's, good, it's a continual graduation. It's, a, it's an elevated, it's a different level of, of education that you will get uh, in knowing God's word and being able to utilize it and apply it to not only your everyday life, but to the lives of other individuals. So that's another way. To, to avoid yielding to temptations, to become a student of God's word and a teacher of God's word. Number two says, why do individuals seek to blame others for their failures? That's a good question. Why do individuals seek to blame others for their failures? And then the last part of that would be, how can we resolve this problem? Here's what I wrote down. It's easier to not be responsible if you don't hold accountability. Okay? It's easier to not be responsible for this getting done, for this being taught, if I don't hold accountability for it. So in, as a Christian, I, I feel accountable for God's word being spread. And we should feel accountable for that. I should be accountable. And if I'm accountable for that, then I'll look at it as a responsibility to make sure it gets done. How, do, how does it get done? My accountability makes me go and find out ways to spread God's word, come up with new ideas, be creative, you know. You know, my accountability. I'm accountable for that. I own that. And so in owning that, how do I get this message out? In owning this and being accountable for this, I can't just sit there and expect because I'm a Christian that everybody else is going to become one because I'm a Christian. I'm, because I'm doing right and I'm trying to do the right thing. Everybody's going to be influenced by me to do the right thing. I've got to put forth some effort. I've got to put forth some initiative to make sure that not only I grow, but others around me grow. That I learn, but others around me learn. Learn what I've learned. So I have to take that responsibility up on myself and make that happen. But I won't do that if I don't feel accountable. I'm accountable by what I put my name down to say I'm going to do. When I say that I will uh, pay this bill, if I say I, if, I had, if I had to get a loan from somebody at a bank or something like that to, for my home and everything like that, then that name that goes down on that piece of paper makes me the accountable individual. And it's my responsibility to make sure that I find the means to pay that bill. I'm the one. My name is on the dotted line. 
I'm the accountable one. I'm the one that you come looking for. That's the name. That's my name. That's the one you come looking for. I'm the Christian. I'm the one who God is looking at. Put my name on the roll of a member of the Church of Christ. I'm the one that should be accountable for making sure that I do what? Go out and seek and save those that are lost. I have to find the avenue whereby to do that. I have to be able to knock on a door without having to have a whole group of members coming together and knock doors. I have to be able to speak out and, uh, and, and defend the gospel when there's nobody else around that's a Christian. I have to stand on the gospel truth. I have to be the one to stand there and take pies in the face or whatever kind of things and cursings that they may do at me because I'm accountable as a Christian to be able to take those things because Jesus took those things. I have to be accountable when it comes to temptation, to not yield to temptation. And the responsibility that's on me, because if I don't be, then it's going to impact other people. Just like Adam's sin impacted others, all of us, impacted me, impacted you. Eve's sin impacted all of us. Then that's the way it's going to be. If I'm not accountable for my Christian walk and doing the right thing, it's going to impact more than just me. So I have to be the one accountable. So why do individuals seek to blame others? Because for one reason, they don't want to be accountable. They don't want to own accountability. And what comes with accountability is responsibility. So they'd rather blame somebody else instead of taking accountability for themselves. If you make yourself accountable for, for everything you do, it's easier to blame self for your own mistakes. If you hold accountability for everything that you do, it's easier to know that, okay, I did that, I own that. That, that was on me. As well as it's easy to say, that wasn't on me. Mm -mm. Because I hold accountability and I know what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm doing it, then I can honestly say, that one, that's not on me. That's not on me. You know, I knew what to do and I did what I was supposed to do. I did what it was told for me to do. You remember I said earlier, if it's written out and these are the criteria on your job, the things that you're supposed to do, and you follow it per what's written, the person that authorized that to be written on that paper, and you're following it just per word for word, letter for letter, doing what you're supposed to do. If something goes wrong and you're following that letter for letter, then it's not on you. If it doesn't work. It's on the person that was responsible and authorized that letter to be written. In God's word, God authorized it, so it's not going to be any wrong. It's going to be 100% right. You follow it to the letter, don't change anything, then this is the only occupation that I know vocation that I know, work that I know, that you can follow it and there won't be a mistake made if you follow it. But if you change anything, add to it or take away from it, I promise you, it may not be right then immediately. It may not even be in that year. It may not be in the next two years. But guaranteed fact, when you change what's right, then it's going to wind up wrong. It'll wind up wrong. It may not impact you. You may be dead before it's gone, but it's going to impact somebody, someone down the line, because it was it meant it started right here where you changed it at. It started right here. The day you changed it was the day it started being wrong, and we don't want to do that. And that's how we can resolve this problem. How by taking the accountability on our own ourse upon ourselves to own the responsibility of it, to own the accountability of it. To not make a mistake in it. And if it is a mistake, don't let it be one that you did. But if it is one that you did, then you own that. Straighten it up. Put it back the way it's supposed to be. Put it back the way it originally was meant to go. And then go from there. Number three says, why do you think Adam and Eve fell victim to the temptation of the serpent? And here's what I wrote. It's almost like a paragraph I wrote it. Possible. It was, it was due, it's possible that it was due to wanting to know why God said, do not do something. You know when your parents used to tell you, don't go over and bother that, don't do this, that, and the other. When they told you don't, that made you so curious. This was, why not? Why? You know, and before you know it, someone along the line, somebody dared you, or you dared yourself to go over and check it out. Mom and dad, they're going grocery shopping. They, don't, they won't know anything about it. If I put it back just like it was, I guarantee you, once you do something you weren't supposed to do, you never put it back the way it was. <laughs> once you move something out of the position that it was in, it's impossible to put it back exactly like it was. 
And I know that from, from experience. I move something, I'll do something. And sometimes you get caught off balance so bad that whatever you move, you weren't supposed to move it, it'll break. Then you, that, that's obvious that you did something you weren't supposed to be doing. But you try to put it back just like it was. And, you know, mom would come in and mom would realize how she had it and say, that thing wasn't turned that direction. Because she knows, she sees it all the time. She's the one that moved like it wasn't. That thing wasn't turned that direction. Boy, you been messing with that thing already? And, you know, of course, the first thing you want to do is probably lie and say no. And you learn that there's a consequence for telling that lie. So maybe the possibility is that they did that because they really truly weren't sure about why God didn't want them to, to know about that. They, uh, uh, why God said, don't do it and everything. And so they wanted to know why did, what, what's so special about it. And that's something that's our order said. What was so special? They were already curious. You know, why not mess with that tree in the midst of the garden? It's good. It looks good. Like all the other trees. You know, it's beautiful to the sight. You know. But he said don't mess with that tree in the midst of the garden. And he didn't even call it out like the devil did. You know, he didn't say it because that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say that. He said don't mess with that tree because the day you do fool with that, touch it, even touch, even touch it, you should surely die. That's all he gave us. That's all he gave us. But that was enough. Should have been. Should have been. But the devil knew that they were curious. And they were asking in their minds why. That's why he went ahead and explained even more so what it was about that tree as God didn't want them, that God didn't want them to know about. The devil came along knowing that there was a curiosity based on their uh, proximity to the tree uh, which was probably looking good. Because so in other words, uh, she was close enough to the tree she was probably already looking at it. Just out of curiosity, I said, nice tree. What's so special about that tree? She done wandered all the way to the middle of the garden to find out what's special about this tree. So she was curious. And so she was led by her own curiosity. And we could call it her own temptation. Being drawn from all the garden, as big as I'm sure it was. It had all the animals on earth in it. It had everything. But here she goes, walking barefooted and naked to that tree. And looking at it and gazing at it, which gave that old serpent an opportunity to say, hmm, I bet I can get it now. Brothers and sisters, when we walk so close to the flame, then you're going to get burned. You don't want to get burned? Don't get close to the flame. When you're a man and if you're a womanizer, don't get close to women that lure your attention. You know, uh, when you when you uh, you like to drink alcohol, don't go to the bar to have lunch. <laughs> when you're a smoker, don't go sit in the break room with a whole bunch of people puffing and you're trying not to puff. It's just that simple. It's that simple. It's just that, that logic right there that makes sense. But to will to, the will to do that and stay away from that, to not be tempted to it, it's hard for man because we think in a carnal state of mind. We think fleshly. So based on that curiosity, that old serpent seen her. She's looking at that tree. She was in close proximity, meaning she was in the area where she was not even supposed to be. In the midst of that garden. And she was there. And looking at it all up and down, I'm pretty sure she was temp being tempted by it. That's all that that old devil needed. I'm calling him the devil because that's what the serpent is. And he see that she was wanting something that she shouldn't have. And that's where it started. She wanted something that she shouldn't have. Brothers and sisters, life goes on. There's a lot of things in life that I've wanted, whether it be a car, it be a house, it be this, it be that, it be clothes, it be a pair of shoes, it be a pair of tennis, it be anything, it be food. You know, you shouldn't have it. Why? Because it's got a lot of stuff in it that your body don't need, and you already got hypertension, so you don't need that. Right? That's full of sodium, it's full of high cholesterol, and all that. But I want it. And you find yourself every once in a while saying, you know what, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to eat that. I'm going to eat it all the time, so I'm going to eat it today. And the day you eat that, because you haven't eaten it all the time, all this time, you haven't even had any, 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 you desired it, but you were strong enough to fight it off. And then that day that you decided to say, I've been doing good. I got my weight down. My cholesterol is good. My blood pressure medicine is working for me. And you eat it, it'll be the day that you can die. And you're going to question. They're going to say, but the boy was so healthy. And that wasn't what killed him. Being healthy didn't kill you. 
Being healthy is not what killed you. When you ate that, it was something else that killed you. Having to do with that. Had you not eaten it, you wouldn't have died, or probably, more likely. You know, so that's, that was it to me. They fell victim to a temptation of that serpent because of their curiosity, because of their lack of attention to what God is saying, because of their disobedient mentality, because of their worldly mentality, of wanting to know so much, even if it meant sacrificing their souls, but wanting to be in the know. I want to know what God knows. Well, brothers and sisters, if we be honest about it, when we read our Bibles, we can know what God knows. Because it's right here. He tells us in his word what he knows. This is all God's knowledge right here. Right there. And when we look at that, we're getting the knowledge of God. You want to know what God thinks and how he thinks? Read your Bible. You want to grow in God's knowledge? Read your Bible. You want to be smart like God? Read your Bible. And you're not going to be smarter than God. Understand what I said. I said like God. I want to be like Christ. Christ is like God. I don't want to be a God. I want to know what God knows. I want to know what he has to say. I want to know how he thinks. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And then you'll understand when he says in the scriptures, he's not going to put any more upon you than you can handle. Because you're not going to want any more upon you than you can handle. You're not going to ask for more than you can handle. You're not going to do more than you can handle. And remember that God, God, all things are possible. That's our lesson for tonight. That's our lesson for tonight. I hope I've encouraged you to continue to study God's word, answer your questions. Even if you have something different, uh, uh, my wife uh, shared with something with me from one of our sisters in the congregation, how she had some discussion questions and how she related her answers to those and uh, send them to us. And so if you have my phone number and you want to do that or you can text me and text that to me, that's fine. That's, that's great. I'd be glad to hear what it is that you were saying in regards to your, to your uh, answers to those questions. And if you have a question for me, same way. Uh, so let's work together. Let's grow together. And if it be the Lord's will, we're going to start up our next lesson on lesson number four, the family of man. The family of man. This is going to be taken out of Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. With that being said, thank you for viewing in with us tonight. May God continue to bless you. Thank you, those that are viewing with us, that are visitors. Uh, to this, uh, to the congregation, and we hope, trust, and pray that we say something that will make you curious enough about your religious stand. If it's not with the Church of Christ, the Body of Christ, and, and question what your religious standpoint is, check out the, the religion that you are a part of and see if it's listed in the Bible. See if it is the church that you are a member of. It's the Bride of Jesus Christ, the Body of Christ. It's important to your spiritual life, everlasting. May God continue to watch over you. May continue to watch and bless each and every individual under the sound of my voice. Let's go to him in prayer. Thank you, God Almighty, for this lesson, for the presentation thereof. And I ask you, God, that they heard this lesson and see this lesson and don't see me. And I pray, God, that I put it out in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. Be with us until the next appointed time, if you will. God, keep and direct us and be with each and every individual under my voice with a special prayer, a special blessing that you see they stand in need of. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. He's a wheel. 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 He's a whe